What's up, guys? This is Sit Down with Sit Podcast. This is season two, episode number nine. Our guest today owned and operated small businesses his entire life and has been helping others become successful running their small businesses for over four decades through writing, speaking, YouTube, and consulting. His primary goal is to help you become more successful personally and professionally. He has been a fan of Elon Musk for a long time and has written best-selling books on the business practices of Elon Musk, the Elon Musk method. And now he joined forces with the popular Tesla news YouTuber, Lars Stand writer of Best in Tesla to unpack the companies that Elon currently runs through his new book, The Elon Musk Mission. Without further ado, it is my pleasure to welcome Randy Kirk. Hi, Randy. Hey, Sid. How are you? <laughs> I am doing great. Uh, Randy, it, you know, I've been so excited to have you on this uh, podcast and, uh, you know, uh, this is going to be fun. So before we kind of dive into the podcast, would you take a moment to uh, talk a little bit about your background so our audience is familiar about yourself a little bit? Well, yeah, it would take me an hour because I, I I have to admit, I have had a very, very interesting career that nobody would have ever expected. I uh, went to uh, undergrad at UCLA and got a degree in psych, and then I went to UCLA Law and got a JD, and I was planning to practice law. Um, in my Between my junior, sometime in my junior year, I started a small business, a bike shop. Mm -hmm. And from there, I went to work for a company that imported padlocks from Germany. And I found that I hated lawyers and I loved business people. <laughs> so so my, my career made an abrupt switch. And I started uh, working for this import company for, a, for several years. And uh, then things changed. And uh, I left that company and started my own uh, wholesale business. And then I started a manufacturing business. Anyway, I think the number of company starts is mm -hmm. now approaching 50 um, and about 25 of those something like that have made have paid me money on a monthly basis so you, I guess you would call those successful uh, startups so oh. yeah I've done everything from uh, again import export to manufacturing to manufacturers rep to consulting to YouTube uh, my latest my latest business is I am now a successful youtuber like you. I actually oh. get revenue every month from being a YouTuber. So, <laughs> so that's my crazy career. Well, um, I also want to talk about, I mean, it's great to know. I mean, I can't believe the amount of businesses you had and the success ratio. That's uh, astronomical, you know, so hats off to you. Um, I want to talk about uh, what, how should I put this man, Elon Musk, you know? Uh, I mean, he is like, I mean, Everyone talks about him. Some call him crazy. Some call him genius. You know, how did you become a fan of Elon Musk? So this is going to sound. I I I I work on this uh, part of my my uh, I don't know my 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 talk about this whole story because it sounds really egotistical, but the truth is I see myself as a little itty bitty tiny Elon. And most people don't get entrepreneurs. Entrepreneurs are a very unique class of people. We start businesses because why? Not to make money. Not because uh, we think we're going to, you know, retire in Hawaii. We start businesses because squirrel, <laughs> you know, because bright, shiny object. There's something we see that needs to be fixed, something that needs to be changed, something that we can do that's going to, that, we think that our customer base would just go crazy over. And we so we start these businesses. And if we're any good at it, we listen carefully to our customers. This is an entrepreneur again. And we're usually really good salespeople. So the combination of listening carefully to our, to our customers, having these crazy ideas of how we can fix things, and then going out and sell, 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 they results in success. And, and that's Elon, okay? And, and a lot of people think that everybody that owns a business is an entrepreneur, and that's just not the case. A lot of people that own businesses own a business because daddy or mommy passed it down to them. Or their uncle said, hey, would you like to come in on this? Or a friend says, boy, did you hear how great the bicycle business is right now? You should open a bike shop. 
and they might be managers. They might be really good at, let's say again, I was in the bicycle industry my whole life. Let's say that they love bicycles and they know how to fix them and they know how to race them. So they're, they're hobbyists and they get into business because they're hobbyists. That's a lot different. It's a completely different story than the entrepreneur. And part of the entrepreneurial thing is that that bright, shiny object, that squirrel problem doesn't stop. And when you're about 70% done building a company, then something will come along that you want to do more. That becomes your new, your new mission. And you're like bored with the old one. And this is a problem for entrepreneurs. And, and so it's a, a case of having to build that team in order to take over so that you can go out and do the next crazy thing you're going to do. So I saw myself as a little Elon Musk. I saw that he was doing things on like everything that he did. It was on such a high level that it was crazy and incomp incomparable in history that anybody had all of these characteristics in one human being. The engineering ability, the, the vision, the, the ability to see a mission and to stay on mission, um, this entrepreneurial nature, this ability to sell. Um, uh, it just, th there was a long list and I've, I ended up with 16 and I've added to that since I wrote the book, The Elon Musk Method. But there was 16 things I said, you know, this is what entrepreneurs do. If I could write this down and, and get it out to entrepreneurs, they could say, okay, this is why Elon does that better than I do. Got he it. pays more attention to his, to his suppliers. This is something many, many small business people don't understand. Your suppliers are more important than your customers. There's lots of customers. And sometimes there's only one or two or three suppliers in a category that you need to run your business. I ended, I had to close one business because there was only two suppliers and they both went out of business. And I, without that supplier, I couldn't have the business. So suppliers are more important. And Elon gets that. It's the supply train, um, the, the supply chain, I'm sorry. Um, and he re recognizes it on another level, which is this vertical integration. I wrote a book for Inc, for, uh, Inc. Magazine, a book, an article for Inc. Magazine years ago on going virtual to vertical, because I saw the same things that Elon sees is that sometimes there's no supplier. You can go, you can go look for a supplier or the supplier that you find is lousy. The quality control isn't there and you need, or maybe the price is too high. You can't really afford that supplier. So you need to get them out of the middle and go make it yourself or go do it yourself. So anyway, that's, that's how I ended up writing the book, the Elon Musk mission uh, method rather. Uh, is because I, I, it was a one in a series of uh, 10 different books I've written on small business that are all designed to help small business owners become better at what they do. So since you are now talking about the Elon Musk method book, would it be, I mean, possible for you to share the 16 secret principles in a nutshell to our audience that, you know, kind of guided Elon Musk in yourself in this venture, you know? Yeah, so I kind of did just then. I, I mentioned several of them, but if you want to start anywhere, it's with mission. Mm -hmm. Okay, so once you need to have a clear mission, and it generally is not going to be just go out and make money. It's going to be, in his case, it's, uh, you know, uh, transition the world to sustainable energy, uh, mm -hmm. become a, a multi-planetary uh, 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 species. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, he has these missions that he's on. And so the missions are more important than money. And, but the amazing thing is if you stay on mission, mm -hmm. it gets you up earlier in the morning and keeps you up later at night. If you work harder during the day and you know what you need to do than when you're chasing dollars. Um, so that's a, a really big one. So, so being mission driven is critical. Well, now you've got a mission, but what do you do next? Well, you're, you need to have really clear goals. And most business owners, most humans don't set goals. It's been proven over and over again that people who set goals and write down goals are mm -hmm. going to be way more successful in life, more way more likely to uh, achieve those goals than people that don't write them down. So setting setting out setting down goals and then making them very specific, you know, is something that Elon obviously does. <laughs> and then being completely fearless. I mean, here's a guy. He's like 26 years old or 20, I forget what he was, I think maybe 28. 
um, uh, I had, maybe he was even 30. Let's okay. call it 30, 31. When he sold PayPal and he's got $180 million in the bank, 160, 180. I, some of these numbers escape me, but I think it was 160, $160 million in the bank. And he's, he says, uh, uh, you know, I want to send a, a, a spaceship to Mars and I want to put a little plant in a, in a container on Mars. I want this spaceship to go up and a robotic arm to come out and place a, 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 a plant on Mars. His entire reason for wanting to do this was to create headlines in order to get NASA back in business because he, he felt like NASA had, had lost the game. They, had, they were no longer, the mission was no longer clear. They mm -hmm. weren't doing things that was designed to, to move the space program forward. This was going to be a big, a big PR move, a big pr a promotional effort to get NASA back in business. So he's going to spend some millions and millions of dollars of the money he just made just to get NASA back on target. Well, so what does he do? He picks up the phone and he calls the guy in Russia who sells used ICBMs. I want my salespeople... <laughs> <laughs> to just have enough nerve to call Walmart, you know? <laughs> to call the buyer whose job it is to interview you and decide whether or not your products fit in Walmart. I want, I want my salespeople to have enough nerve to just make calls all day long, even after they've been told no a few times. But here's a guy <laughs> who picks up the phone and goes to Russia and sits down with the head of the ICBM program there to buy a used uh, to buy a used rocket and the guy spits on his feet. Literally, this is, you know, the biggest insult in Russia is to spit on a guy's shoe. So the guy spits on his shoe. He gets on a plane, goes back home. And on the way back, he writes down first, uses first principles to write down what it would take for him to build his own rocket. <laughs> wow. Now this is, this is having nerves of steel. This is having, um, uh, no fear. Um, there's a, an example I use in, um, in the book. I talk about uh, uh, the famous book, War and Peace. And in the book, War and Peace, Tolstoy talks about uh, war. Okay, And he talks about these guys being on the battlefield and what determines who, the guy, who should be the sergeant, who should be the lieutenant. And the guys that should be the sergeant and the lieutenant are the guys that will fearlessly be the first ones across the first ones out of the uh, out of the uh, uh, what do you call it out of you know in, into battle the ones that are going to lead the charge fearlessly do that even though the bullets are flying everywhere and how do they become that fearless they according to Tolstoy they become that fearless because they've are they decide they're they're as good as dead already so they don't have to worry about it they just assume they're dead and I think that was, I think that's what Elon does. I think Elon says, you know, it just doesn't matter. You know, I'm going to be dead. Just go for it. What, and, but most people are not that fearless. If people were more fearless, they would be more successful. I've sold Target. I've sold Toys R Us. I've sold, uh, I've been on every, I've sold, I've sold product on four of the seven continents. Um, you have to be fearless. You have to be willing to go out and call on, call on your customer. So Randy, I have a I have a question on this. So, how do you differentiate being fearless and being realistic? And the same thing I would say for the goals. You know, yes, that is true. What you shared, writing a goal every single day makes you more successful than people who don't write. Right. But once again, uh, you know, it's entrepreneurship is is a very tricky road. You know, it's it takes a lot of understanding failures testing to become one yes. you know and a lot of people don't you know i used to live in san francisco and i would go to go to these venture uh, capital meetings and the stat was nine out of ten startups fail only one succeed right? right and they all had the same dream same goal to become an entrepreneur right so my question to you is now how do you differentiate realistic goals or being realistic, or being fearless, or just, I mean, shooting the arrow in the sky? Yes. Yeah, so I've been thinking a lot about this actually recently. So this will, this is my, 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 a, a recent kind of an, uh, epiphany that I had. Mm -hmm. 
So some people get up in the morning and they can't, they can barely imagine how they're going to get through the day. You know, they, they look at the day and they go, oh my gosh, you know, I've got to get in my car and drive through the rain an hour. You know, maybe it'll take me two hours because, you know, I'm in, I'm in Los Angeles right now and we've been having mm -hmm. all this rain. So maybe it's going to take me two hours instead of an hour or three hours. Oh my gosh, that's gonna be terrible. And then when I get there, I, I'm facing all these issues and all these problems and, oh, ugh, you know, and they're whining and complaining. Okay. Mm -hmm. then we, maybe we have the next level up and the next level up is somebody who says, oh, you know, I have these, I have a degree, I have this knowledge, I have this sophistication, I have this experience, and I'm going to get go out there today and I'm going to make those phone calls and I'm going to call folks and I'm going to, I think I could make $100,000 this year, you know, as a salesman, or maybe, maybe the boss will give me a raise and I'll mm -hmm. finally break the six figures. Um, maybe, maybe I'll break, maybe I'm already at 100,000. So I'm thinking about how I could get to 125. So there's this, that's kind of another level. Then there's a, a level that I would call the maybe the entry level entrepreneur and the entry level entrepreneur says, you know, I think I could open a coffee shop mm -hmm. or, or I think I could open a restaurant. By the way, restaurants, one of the hardest business in the world. Yes. But people don't think that they think it's easy, but it's one of the hardest business. Don't open a restaurant <laughs> unless you really know what you're doing. But um, uh, I think I could open a bike shop. I think I could open a locksmith shop, whatever. So there's people that think, you know, that are they're on that level. Their ego allows them to believe that they could do that level. Okay. Well, that's realistic for them. But if they woke up in the morning without degrees and without knowledge and without sophistication and without experience and said, I want to put a rocket on the moon, that would be nuts. Mm -hmm. But for Elon Musk, it's not. I fit, like I said, I kind of fit in the middle. I woke up one morning and said, I think I can start a manufacturing business. Um, and I did, you know, and I ended up with a hundred employees and, and, you know, I, I thought I could do that. I didn't have it. I didn't really ever doubt that I could do that, but I certainly didn't know, ever wake up in the morning and think that I was going to start a company that was going to have a hundred thousand employees. That's never been in my expectation of who I was as a person. So I think that re realistic aspect is different for every single person. That's a, that's a great answer, uh, Randy. Um, I also want to talk about, um, okay, I want to go back to your Elon Musk method book, and then I want to talk about the Elon Musk mission before we get into the main topic of this uh, podcast, which is Tesla, you know? So um, how, how did you, how was the perception of the readers uh, for the Elon Musk uh, method book? You know, what was the feedback? Were you happy? Were you like, you know what? Maybe when I write the next book, this is the area I want to improve. Give us some feedback on that. Yeah. So I think the, again, the the reviews on Amazon, which is about all you have to go on, um, you know, we're good. And and I it has been translated into five languages. And so I was happy with that. Um, and so, uh, you know, overall, I think the book was successful. Um but at the end of the day, no, I thought I thought there would be a larger market. Mm -hmm. um, I thought there would be more people that would be interested in how Elon does it. Uh, but that's kind of what I'm saying with regard to this analysis that I've been doing recently. And it's in the book, too. I talk in the very beginning of the book about these five categories of business mm -hmm. owners. Mm -hmm. You know, that they're not all entrepreneurs. And so I think that I was right. <laughs> a person that is a great manager, making $125,000 a year, happy to be making $125,000 a year, running a shoe store, doesn't see it ever being two fifty, dollars and his spouse is also working. Uh, they got their medical covered by the, by, by the spouse's uh, enterprise, you know, and they're like, okay, we're making $200,000, $250,000 a year. We can raise our kids. This is great. That person's never going to read the Elon Musk method. So it's this little subset of mm -hmm. folks that really have this entrepreneurial thinking and way of being that read the book. Maybe some salespeople, because I, I claim that salespeople are entrepreneurs, real, true salespeople that love selling, <laughs> by the way, <laughs> are actually entrepreneurs that are risk averse. So they want somebody to take all the main risks. They'll mm -hmm. take the risk of making the call. They'll take the risk of working on commission. 
but they don't want to take the big risk of opening the factory and hiring the people and doing all that. So I think maybe some salespeople, if, if you're a salesperson and you love to read books that are uh, motivating, uh, read the Elon Musk uh, method. Um, so, or some of my other books, actually, the Think and Grow Rich, I'm Think and Grow Rich, that's not mine. <laughs> when Friday Isn't Payday is my best selling book ever, When Friday Isn't Payday. And so if, if, if you're a salesperson or you, you have that kind of mentality, or even if you are just a manager, When Friday Isn't Payday is the book to read. But for the entrepreneurial person who really wants to hit, hit it out of the park, then it would be the Elon Musk method. Amazing. So what transpi uh, transpired you to now write your new book, Elon Musk Mission? Uh, uh, you know, you have actually collaborated with a few people and you brought in an expert of, correct me if I'm wrong, 50 experts who cross-check everything you wrote because you wanted to make sure you were on the money with the facts that you have shared. So give us uh, uh, some feedback, some insight into your new book. And, and for our audience who are listening to this, we will have the links of these two books in the description. So please grab a copy, you know, and uh, let's continue to support Randy and Elon Musk. Uh, go ahead, Randy. Yeah. So um, again, entrepreneurial Randy, you know, I'm sitting there and I'm watching this whole Tesla thing on, you know, develop. Mm -hmm. uh, I, actually, it all started with writing in somebody's S. You know, about uh, six years ago, this guy got his Model S and mm -hmm. Is, hey, take a ride of my Model S, you know, and we get in and it's like, oh my gosh. And I've always been a car guy. I've had, you know, lots and lots of fast cars. I currently drive a Volvo 300 horsepower, you know, twin turbo. Uh, my wife has the Tesla. <laughs> so, but I don't drive enough miles to justify getting a second Tesla. So right now I'm driving a very fast car, but not as fast as if I switched to Tesla. So anyway, I'm watching this whole thing unfold. I'm watching, you know, so I write in that card. I'm like, already like, oh my gosh, this is something I need to learn a lot more about. I jump into it. I start learning more about it. I've loved I've played the stock market since I was 18. So I start dibble dabbling in, in Tesla shares. And pretty soon I'm realizing what all the other YouTubers realized. And I'm listening to these YouTubers, Stephen Mark Ryan and Rob Maurer and, and Dave Lee and all these guys. And I'm listening to them. And I'm, I'm realizing that there's so much FUD. There's so much disinformation. FUD is fear, uncertainty, and doubt. Mm -hmm. There's so much misinformation. And there's actually Tesla or Tesla Q mm -hmm. are people out there that are purposely trying to destroy Tesla. And I'm like, that makes sense. They work for a car company. They work for an oil company. <laughs> they work for you know so many companies that Elon is going to put out of business. Of course, they're going to put out negative stuff about Tesla and try to destroy it. Or in many cases, by the way, Elon Musk is not sure about global warming. I'm not sure about global warming. I am sure that I live in Los Angeles and I grew up in a time in Los Angeles when there was lots of smog. I don't want particulate matter going into my lungs. So I would love to clear the air. I would love to mm -hmm. do away with petroleum products. Whether global warming is true or not, I don't care. I just want to get rid of petroleum products in order to clear the air. And if that solves global warming at the same time, hallelujah. And I think that's exactly where Elon is. And by the way, I read the IPCC report, the last one. And last night, I read the most recent one. And so so I'm, I'm actually looking right now for somebody to debate me about the IPCC on my channel, because I really want to get to the bottom of what are the real what, what are we really facing in terms of a future? Anyway, that's a whole other subject. <laughs> so I'm reading about all this, all this uh, FUD and all this Tesla Q stuff. And I'm going, this is, this is ridiculous. You know, there needs to be not just these YouTube channels, there needs to be a book. There needs to be a one source book where people can go and they can feel like these are the true facts about Elon Musk, not just Tesla, but all of his companies. So I ended up, uh, you know, uh, getting um, Lars Renritter, uh, who's uh, at uh, 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 best, my, uh, <laughs> best in Tesla. Best in Tesla. I got Lars on board. He's got a great channel. And Lars did a great job writing a number of chapters. And then I got Brian Wong. And Brian Wong is brilliant. <laughs> He's one of the smartest guys you're ever going to meet. 
And Brian is really, really knows SpaceX, really, really knows Starlink, understands all this business with regard to T-Mobile and everything. Um, and also is has been on my channel a number of times talking about the semi and how amazing the semi is and people just aren't paying any attention. And then I, finally, I got uh, Mr. No, Dr. Know-it-all, uh, 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 John uh, Bi <laughs> Why am I having such a trouble with these guys' names today? John Biggs. Um, I think I'm blowing that, by the way. There's something Briggs, John. Anyway, Dr. Know-it-all. I got Dr. Know-it-all. Oh, I just got to pull it right over here. <laughs> right over here. Make sure I get Gibbs. <sighs> Man. John Gibbs. So I got John Gibbs. And John Gibbs is a guy that has been dealing with um, uh, all aspects of, of um, um, graphic robot, uh, gra the graphic aspects of robots uh, and AI for his career. He, he is a PhD. Um, I, you know, and, and, uh, uh, so I got all these experts. I got these guys that could write in their very specific categories and give really expert results. Then we got 50, we actually had almost a hundred people on board, but 50 of these were people that helped to edit the book and fact mm -hmm. check us. And so it took us a while to get all that done. But when we got done and we published it, I have not had a single person. I have, I'm honestly, truth, truthfully, there's been 180 reviews now on Amazon. Not one of them has questioned the facts. So that's amazing. That was the goal is to have a fact based book that would explain all the Elon Musk companies and would also make some predictions and projections about what the future looked like with regard to Elon Musk and with regard to these companies. And so I felt really good about the results um, with not one person, not one person questioning it, one fact so far. Now that's that's astounding, you know, so many reviews and everything is heading in the right direction for you with this book, you know. And I'm sure back in your mind, you're probably thinking about next Elon Musk book, you know, <laughs> knowing you. Uh, I'm sure, you know, uh, so we probably wanted to you. write. So we wanted to write the Elon Musk magic. And the goal of the Elon Musk magic was going to be to talk about what does the world look like 10 years from now? Because I, I ended up watching a bunch of old movies last year. My wife and I, we said, let's go back and look at all the Academy Award winners from starting in 1927 forward. And so we did. And we watched all these Academy Award winners. And, you know, you look at these old movies and I'm old enough to be able to think back that long, <laughs> almost that long. And you look back at these old movies and, and you think about what it was like growing up. Your day-to-day -day life hasn't changed that much. You know, okay, your telephone calls are free now. They used to cost 10 cents to call the next city. Um, now they're free. Uh, the, your flashlight is free. It's built into your phone. <laughs> you know, there's a lot of little things that are really important you never have to go to a library again because the the, the, the never all did. the libraries of the world are on your phone. So there's a lot of stuff that is different and very, very helpful. And it's making the world wealthy as heck. And not just America, but third world nations are getting wealthy at a rate unparalleled in history. So we were thinking, okay, how do we tell a story that maybe looks at what the world's going to look like in 10 years and as we looked at it, I'm like, you know, I'm probably still going to be living in, in my condo here on the golf course. <laughs> and it probably won't look that different, you know, moment by moment. And um, so anyway, we haven't written that book yet. We've played with it and toyed with it. And then I, like you, I realized, oh, my gosh, YouTube, um, I can reach 7,000 people a day um, instead of 7,000 people total over the run of a book. I mean, a really good book maybe sells 100,000 copies. I'm talking to over 100,000 people a month on YouTube, and close yeah. to 200,000 people a month. So it's like, maybe I should spend the time doing YouTube instead of writing books. So right now, at least, uh, my emphasis in terms of my career as a teacher, which is kind of how I see myself as, as relaying information that might be that, okay, nobody has time to learn about everything. Right. So maybe you, maybe five years ago, as a te new Tesla fanboy, I'm watching three or four YouTubers, um, and that's how I'm getting my information about Tesla. Well, now I spend two hours a day researching, another hour a day listening to YouTubers, 
and then two or three hours a day doing my own YouTube or, or and my own, I have a few other businesses, but, but, you know, so not everybody can do what I do. And they are back where I was five years ago and they just need somebody that can relay the information, pull it together and give it to them in, in a, in a, a, a bite-sized piece that helps them understand Tesla or helps them understand Elon or helps them become a better entrepreneur. So I'm assuming the Elon Musk magic is on hold for now. It's on hold for now. <laughs> Good. <laughs> I'm sure, you know, uh, that would be something I would be watching, you know, for it to come out. Um, I want to talk about Tesla, you know. Uh, I also want to share global EV electric vehicle market highlights before I ask you the question related to Tesla. So the global market for EV is estimated it was 9.5 million units in 2022 and it is projected to reach a size of 80, close to 81 million units by 2030. Now, um, also in 2022, 4.3 million new EVs were sold during the first half year, which was a 62% increase compared to 2021, according to EV volumes. So, so it is, once again, it is one of the fastest growing sector you know, in the in the auto industry. And and I also want to share a couple of EV stats in United States before I ask you the question that in United States, Tesla is the number one player. You know, Model 3 and Model Y accounts for the majority of the sales in the United States. And actually on March 15th, according to Automotive News, Tesla sales jumped 34% in US in January of 2023 compared to 2022, which was close to almost 50,000 vehicles per month, right? So this is great. Now, I wanna ask you about Tesla. So, you know, I'm gonna break this down in few bullet points so it's easier for us to chime into each sector. I wanna talk about, you know, what's going on with Tesla, you know, uh, the stock price, the volatility, the volatility in the market related to um, Tesla stock, which you also mentioned in your video, latest video. You know, you talked about it uh, once the Yellen and Powell tried to crash the market, right? And and what do you think is the future prediction in the EV sector by 2030? Okay, now that's several questions. All right, let's see if we can take them um, take them in what order. All right, let's let's start. Hmm. Let's start with the volatility and the and the way the street perceives Tesla. Sure. Okay. First of all, and I don't think I've ever said this out loud before, so you're going to be a newsbreaker today. <laughs> okay. I've never said these words out loud before. Mm -hmm. Tesla is fairly valued mm -hmm. within a range. Okay. So most people think, most people that are fanboys like me think Tesla is wildly undervalued, okay? And I would say that's also true, okay? Now, are you talking that from a consumer point of view or from the Wall Street point of view? I just want to make sure we are clear on that. From a somebody who studied the market since I was 18 years old mm -hmm. um, and who loves studying the, the, the economy and how the economy works, and 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 believe in my big-headed way that I that I understand some of it. <laughs> so the market has a mm -hmm. bunch of different plays. Sure. Okay. So there's risk off plays, there's risk on plays. Um, there is, you know, things like where you buy um you buy Walmart because you know you're going into recession and you're gonna go risk off and you want to buy something that's gonna be a, a staple uh during a recession. And then you've got, you know, pharmaceutical companies or startup pharmaceuticals that you buy because you know that one out of 10 of them is going to succeed. And so you, the, the one that succeeds will make up for the nine that you lose. So there's all these different plays. Sure. So you end up that every stock ultimately has a story mm -hmm. or a narrative. But some stocks are just much bigger narratives or much bigger stories because maybe they have a really interesting aspect to them. Or maybe they have a charismatic leader as the CEO. Think Steve Jobs. Think, uh, think many, many different companies over the years. 
So you could have a charismatic leader. You could have a really crazy, wild and crazy product that's coming out. You could have um, uh, you know, a growth curve that is really amazing. They take Costco. Um, you know, so there's all kinds of different stories and some some companies have bigger stories than other other companies. Well, Tesla probably has the biggest story of all. Mm -hmm. Again, all the superlatives that go with with Tesla, it's crazy. But at this point, Tesla's story might be bigger than Apple's story, which was probably the biggest story of our lifetime. Yes. Probably Apple. General Electric before that was probably the biggest story. And then Apple was the big story. Oh, Amazon. You could throw Amazon in there. Uh, you could throw, uh, obviously, uh, Walmart in there. So there's been a bunch of story stocks in our lifetime. But Apple was probably the biggest one and has become the second biggest company in the world now after Aramco. Um, and uh, and the second largest, I think, or third largest in terms of, of gross dollar volume mm -hmm. uh, after Walmart and I'm sorry, af yeah, after Walmart and uh, Remco. Mm -hmm. So so you have these story stocks. Well, the story on Tesla is mission driven, partially. Mm -hmm. A whole bunch of people are in it because of the mission. Mm -hmm. Then you have a bunch of people that are in it because of Elon. Then you have a bunch of people in it because it's a growth stock, but you don't have anybody in it because it's a value stock. All right. So you're in it because you're a fanboy of the company mm -hmm. or the man, or you're in it because the growth is crazy and you want to be part of that growth. And the growth people are probably mostly in and out of it. They're, they're day traders or, or they trade in and out based mm -hmm. on what they're, what they're seeing in, in the technicals or whatever are the fundamentals, but the fanboys and the of the company are of Elon or both, mm -hmm. they're in it forever. They're not trading in and out. They brag about the fact that they're in for 10 years. They don't care what happens. They're just buying more, buying more, buying more. So this is again um a so unique, Randy, I'm a sorry to interrupt. I want to ask regard. you one thing. Yeah. Sorry. So the fanboys, as you said, who are in there for long term, they are there for Elon Musk, right? There is something that they trust, right? Now a lot of things that he says, which I also see a lot of uh, major shareholders uh, pointing their own, you know, debating his own facts, like, you know, yes. we'll talk about the investors day. So, so are these people, once again, my question comes down to, is this realistic? That's my thing. Yes, it's good to support someone who has this mission, right? Like we talk, talked about SpaceX. He wanted right. to bring NASA out. Right. But reality and dreaming are two different things, right? right? We have not seen the future, right? So, 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 so that's why I wanted to ask you now. I understand the concept; it's a growth-driven stock, and you said it perfectly. Not everyone is in it, right? Because the value, correct? So, so my thing is. You know, I just wanted to ask you that, so I'm going to let you continue, but I'm sorry if I interrupt you in these things, because I just want to understand, make sure that people understand some of these words, these things that we're talking about, because not everyone understands the EV sector, the stock market, the technicals, the fundamentals. So our job here is to make it as easy as we can, <laughs> right, right? Right, right, right. In a yes. short amount of time. Go ahead, please. Yes. So up until two and a half years ago, mm -hmm. You're you're not going to buy Tesla based on the fundamentals. It was a hundred percent story stock at that point. You're okay. not buying it for the fundamentals. You're buying it because you believe in it. You can see the future. Mm -hmm. You're hope, you're hopeful that Elon pulls off what he says he's going to pull off. Because if he does, it's crazy. So there's a that, there's that kind of stock investor out there that says, look, uh, like the pharmaceutical company, it's a it's a ten percent chance. But if that ten percent right. happens. It's crazy. It's crazy time. And so right. you had a lot of people become Tesla heirs. They became millionaires because they bought in in 2016, 2015, and mm -hmm. they rode it right up to becoming millionaires. They didn't have to buy very much to become a millionaire. So, so now you, now you have a track record though. Now you're in 2023 mm -hmm. and you're starting to see a track record. You're seeing that in 2014, when Elon said he'd build 500,000 cars in 2020, he did. Okay. Then he says in 2019, I'm going to start building 50% more car. I'm going to start selling 50% more cars per year, every year going for not every year, rather on average mm -hmm. going forward. 
on average. That's what he said, to be clear. Not I will grow 50% every year. On average, I'll grow 50% per year. Well, as of 2023, he's on pace. He's already done that in 2021, 2022, and he's on pace to do that in 2023. In fact, I think he'll beat it by a lot. Uh, we'll see it uh, 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 next uh, Sunday. We'll probably see the numbers. And right now, it looks like the first quarter will beat the fourth quarter, which Tesla doesn't normally do. They don't normally beat fourth quarter in the first quarter. So he's still on this trajectory. The fans know, and the people that study it like I do, and maybe you do, know that there's so much more to this business than the cars now. So the people that are investing in Tesla today are now like the people in 2016 that saw what was going to happen with the cars. Well, the car thing is just execution now. It's really just a matter of can they continue to build factories and continue to build cars? And if they build the cars, it looks like people are going to buy them. Um, and they have a trajectory and they have the new cars that are planned, the new trucks that are planned. And it looks like they can continue this trajectory. Well, not everybody believes that. Gary Black, who's a big Twitter guy that a lot of people respect, says that he thinks he'll get to 10 million. Um, Stephen Mark Ryan, who's a, one of the biggest bulls of all, thinks he'll only get to 18, billion, 18 million cars by 2030. I think it's a cinch to get to 20 million by 2030, but I'm, I'm a really big bull. Um, but that's just the cars. And people are like, well, you know, full self, everybody was buying it because of full self-driving and because of robo-taxi and that's never happening. And it, you know, it might not happen for years. And I'm like, okay, it might not happen for years. If it ever happens, oh my gosh, you know, Katie bar the door, as we used to say, you know, 30 years ago, the stock is going to go like this if there is ever a robo-taxi business. And I personally think there will be, and it'll probably be sooner than most people think. But if it's 2027, I'm okay mm -hmm. with that. But in the meantime, you now have an energy business that is growing way faster than the car business. Yeah. And is likely to start throwing off a billion dollars in profit per quarter, maybe more, starting with this quarter. We'll have to see because there's some questions on how the bookkeeping works and whatnot. But, but it could be a billion dollars in the first quarter in the energy sector, maybe more. By the second quarter, I think it will be. You have the semi-truck, which is as big or bigger than the car business because every semi-truck sold is the equivalent of four to five, even maybe six cars in terms mm -hmm. of gross revenues and probably mm -hmm. more than that in gross profit. So you have the semi-business, you have the energy business, you have the whole AI thing with Dojo, which we won't go into here. You have, mm -hmm. They're in the insurance business. They have all of these uh, stations all over the world where, where they're the charging stations. They will have 100,000 charging pumps, if you will, mm -hmm. or stations, sure. not, mm -hmm. not, not locations, but pumps mm -hmm. um, by the end of next year, 100,000. And that's just by the end of next year. So look, go forward. You're looking at a million of these around the world uh, of these of these charging stations. Um, so there's all kinds of additional businesses, but there's in my mind there are three, four. Let's call it four major ones. Mm -hmm. Very quickly, I already mentioned the semi. I already mentioned the energy business, but then you do have the robo taxi, mm -hmm. which is going to happen someday. But the other big one, the biggest one of all, is Optimus. And Elon Musk believes he's going to replace, not replace. I hate to say it the way replace. Elon Musk believes that Optimus the robot, the humanoid robot, will create a new labor source mm -hmm. that he believes will duplicate the population of the world. He believes there will be 8 billion Optimuses. Now, Do you believe that? I am so sold on this. I can't begin to tell you. This is like being back when I first rode the Model S. And let me tell you why. And how, again, it sounds braggadocia. It sounds like I have an ego the size of Mars. But it's only because this is what I've done for a living. Okay. I was a manufacturer for 29 years, a plastics manufacturer. Mm -hmm. So I have that experience that most people don't have of actually inventing things, creating automation, creating, you know, buying robots for my factory, um, you know, 
finding methods to make things less expensive. I've done all that stuff for 30 years. I have patents, I have trademarks, you know, I have invented products. When I saw Optimus on AI Day 2, and I saw the very small amount of things he was able to do, I was already ready to make my deposit. Please, please, Elon, make these available. He's already capable of doing work in my old factory. Because what a lot of people are looking at when they look at this at this level mm -hmm. is well, how's he get, how's Optimus? We already have these big arms that come down and you know put doors on and do all this stuff. You know, you already have all these major robots that are happening in a car factory. What people don't think about is my little plastics manufacturing company with 100 employees. Okay. There was lots of jobs that that robot could do that I could not automate. Okay. There was no way, there was not enough volume, even though we made 5 million bottles a year, but that 5 million bottles a year was not enough volume to automate all the processes. And if, there, if it had been 10 million, maybe yes, at 100 million for sure. Okay. But it wasn't always true that I could automate every process because those process, when you, when you buy that automation equipment, it is static. You buy that arm. Okay. It goes, it goes nailed into the, into the floor. Okay. It's bolted into the floor. It can't move. It has one job. It goes and picks this up and it moves over here and puts this down. Okay. It only has that job. That's all it can do. Now you can reprogram it, but it's really hard, but you can reprogram it and maybe you can reprogram it to go over here instead of over there, you know, <laughs> but you can't reprogram it to uh, take out the mail. You can't reprogram it to pick up a box off a shelf and take it up to shipping. Uh, you can't reprogram it to pick up a bolt and put the bolt up uh, in, into a, into, uh, onto a nut and then uh, pick up a, a, a ratchet and, and uh, tighten it down. You can only reprogram that thing to do a few things. And that mm -hmm. arm probably cost you a couple hundred thousand dollars. Now you've got Optimus, which maybe if, if, if they sell them, and who knows if they sell them or not, but Elon said it'd be cheaper than a car. So let's say it's 30 grand, not 100 grand, not 200 grand for that arm. No, it's 30 grand for this Optimus robot that you can now teach it. <laughs> you don't program it. You go over to that bolt and that nut and you, you pick up the, you personally, the robot watches you, you pick up the nut and you put it on the bolt and you, and you tighten it by hand and then you pick up the ratchet and then you tighten it down. And then you tell the robot to do it. And now the robot does it as best as it can and you say, no, 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 try it this way. If you, if, if you play with chat GPT, you're already doing this. You're saying, write me a script about, um, about uh, Optimus the robot. And it writes a script and you go, oh, well, no, could you, could you tell me more about, um, could you tell me more about how the robot um, is able to walk through a room? So it writes more about that. You go, yeah, but why doesn't it fall over? And it writes about that. In the very same way, you're teaching the robot, the robot over tightens the nut. So you go back and you, you literally tell the robot and show the robot, no, don't tighten it that much, okay? Or you can use simulation to teach it. Now, once you've taught that one robot how to do, tighten a nut on a bolt like that, now you have an over the air update to all the robots that Tesla has ever made teaching mm -hmm. it how to, to tighten a nut on a bolt. Now, you don't need it to do the tightening the nut on the bolt anymore. You've, you, you no longer make that product. Now you get that same robot and you bring it over and you say, hey, I need you to put caps on these bottles. And you teach it how to do that. And you're getting all of that for a fraction of the cost of, the, of an employee for one year. Well, I, I can't even imagine right now the world like that. Actually, you're talking, I'm like trying to envision that. I'm like, I can't get my head around, <laughs> wrapped around it, you know. But listen, you know, he can do anything. He has shown that in the past. And, uh, you know, uh, so 
as, a, as we will see how it, how it pans out, you know. Um, so, so the investor, the investor day story, the investor day, you know, uh, video that people should look at. I think if you just uh, Google or YouTube, go on YouTube and go investor day, Optimus the bot or Optimus the robot, I think you'll be able to pick up the clip and it shows the progress in six months of what that bot was able to do. And it was tightening down bolts and it was walking across the room without any kind of a tether to keep it from falling. I mean, it's, it's, it's wow. real, it's real folks. It is not, this is not something that's coming in 10 years. It's not something coming in five years. It's something that factories will be buying. In my opinion, it will be available to buy for factory use in 2024. Wow. Wow. <laughs> Blown away, you know, if that happens. Uh, Randy, I want to talk about the stock price. You know, there is a lot going on. I mean, uh, it reached its peak. Uh, first of all, why do you think the stock is, you know, bullish trend, bearish trend? I mean, it lost 70% of its share value in 2022, although Tesla had a great year in 2022. So from your understanding and being a long-time investor, what do you think is going on? on with the stock price? I mean, is it the economy? Is it the market? Is it the company? Is it Elon Musk? You know, there is a lot of um, media bashes Elon every single day. Then they praise him one day and the stock price goes 8% up. Give us your take, you know, what's going on? Okay, so do you have another hour? Okay, I'm going to do my best in a few minutes because all of the things that you said are affecting it. But the number one thing that affects it is the story. Okay, because remember, this is a story stock. Okay, when Steve Jobs died, the stock tanked. Had nothing to do with the fundamentals and the company has gone crazy since. But when Steve Jobs died, the story, the, the, the story was over. It tanked. Oh, when Steve Jobs left Apple the first time, the company almost went out of business and the, and the stock went away. When Steve Jobs came back, all of a sudden, okay, you got this entrepreneurial, this guy, this person that people know his capabilities. They might not like him. They may not agree with his politics. They might think that he's silly sometimes. Um, they may think he's juvenile sometimes, which I would agree with. Sometimes he's juvenile. Um, but lots of adult men are juvenile. <laughs> I don't know if you've noticed, but lots of men, the 51 year old men like Elon are very juvenile in their behavior. Give me a break. So, <laughs> so people are expecting him to, to be different, but he's so transparent and so real that he's acting pretty much like a 51 year old man. All right. So, um, so you have this bigger than life guy mm -hmm. at the top of it. You have a stock that was valued really high, okay, in a, in a market where risk on was totally there. I mean, everybody was like, I'll take the risk. I'll take the risk. Where can I put my money where I'm going to get the biggest return? Yes, Tesla's going crazy. So, boy, I can put some money in there and I can make money. All the retail investors were coming in. All the retailers are coming in and putting money in it. The institutions mm -hmm. are way back here because the stock is not rated. It's rated as junk. You know, right. so they're the institutions are way back here, but this the story people are all pouring the money in and it's going crazy. Well, the market completely changed its mind, which it does all the time. And the market says, oh no, the, if the Fed is going to raise raise the interest rates like this, risk is off. All of these growth companies are going to get slammed, which they did. Okay. I've got all of uh of uh, uh, these risk companies are all lined up on my little stock checker on my phone and Tesla and all these other risk companies kind of go the same, ARK Invest and all these guys, they kind of go the same every day. And most of them lost 70, 80% of their value, just like Tesla did. So I believe that it was 100% driven, not 100%, it was 60 to 70% driven by the narrative. Mm -hmm. Another 10 or 20% by Elon's various actions, whether it's buying Twitter, whether it's selling Tesla stock, whether it's doing, you know, making statements that the liberals didn't like, you know, there's a whole bunch of things that he did. Yes. So there was a 10 or 20% that was to do with what Elon was doing. And then I think there was a 10% factor that was probably, um, how is he going to do what he said he was going to do mm -hmm. in a recession? His margins are going to go away. 
He's not going to be able to sell as many cars as he said. Um, so therefore, in a recessionary situation, we got to take some money off the table. So all that happened. Now you've got a, this response. It's come back almost a uh, almost 100 percent from its lows. Mm -hmm. It's still 100. It's still 50 uh, percent of its highs. Right. I'm predicting it's going to go back to 400 this year. And the reason that I'm saying that it's going to go back to 400 this year is because the new story, and I've been talking about this now on my channel, the new story is Tesla is a growth stock that is also a blue chip. It becomes more Apple-like. It becomes more Costco-like. Mm -hmm. Okay, This is a company that's probably going to do fine in a recession. It may not do great in a recession. It's going to do fine in a recession. It's got $20 billion net cash in the bank. How many companies do you think in the world have $20 billion net cash in the bank? I tried to get ChatGPT to tell me that, and I couldn't get it to do it. <laughs> but I'm going to say it's on the order of 30. In the world, companies that are as blue chip as Tesla, who mm -hmm. has 22 billion in cash and only 1.5 billion in um, in in uh, long term loans. So, it's a blue chip stock now that people can depend on and know it's going to still be here. Oh, by the way, it's also throwing off a billion to two billion dollars a quarter in free cash flow. Very few companies do that. Mm -hmm. And it's throwing off that free cash flow at the same time that its capex is huge as they're building factory after factory around the world and improving their other factories. So there's no company, there's no other company now mm -hmm. like Tesla, not even close in terms of its value proposition, in terms of its growth proposition, growing from this from this high of a cap a cap already and growing at fifty percent per year going forward. And there's never been a company in history like this, ever, that's grown at this level when it was already this big. So um, that's why I believe I believe the story will change now that uh, Moody's has joined S and P and said mm -hmm. that this is a blue chip stock, that it's got a it's got an A A rating, a double A rating, and I think later this year it'll get a triple A rating. So you're you're going to be looking at the the. Invest in, investment community is going to now say, okay, this is a value stock, but it also has this amazing growth potential. So I can I can hold it as something that I can trust, and yet it might go nuts. So but, how many opportunities are there like that? But a but couple of things. Wall Street says it should be valued at $160 per share. Number two which I see it all the time, the PE ratio of a car company, you know, at the end of the day, Tesla is a car company, right? No, it's an, no. People say it's a software. They offer, they want to do into the battery production, a lot of things they want to do. I'm telling you what I'm hearing from the media, right? I do not agree with a lot. I do agree with some. Now, the PE ratio of Tesla is actually more than GM and Ford combined. Which, which they also made more money last quarter. Last yes. year, they made yes. more money than GM and Ford combined. Yes. So, I mean, how do you debate that? I mean, Wall Street, I mean, if the market is saying, hey, it's $160, that's the value. That's the real value of the share. Uh, I mean, how do you go against the market? I mean, don't they see the fundamentals and the growth of the story that we see? Yeah. So here's, so here's the part. Here's the part that I don't get about the market. These are things that should be obvious to the market. Margins matter. Mm -hmm. I mean, all I care about as a manufacturer is my margins. My my, uh, my banker used to tell me the reason that I'm willing to, to to lend money to you is because your margins are crazy. I don't know how you get these kind of margins as a manufacturer. Mm -hmm. that, that was my banker talking, not me. I care about margins. If I got the margins, I'm going to succeed. Well, Tesla has... 26, 25, 26, 27% margins on their cars. Forget what their margins are going to be on energy or robots, but right now they have 27%, 26, whatever margins on their cars, and they have an operating margin after all expenses in the high teens. Well, that's triple, quadruple, five times what auto companies have. It's Maserati level margins. 
It's the only car company that is even close in terms of margins. All the rest of the car companies are, their operating margins, 5%, 6%, 4%, 3%, zero, losing money. And then you look at the all the auto companies, you're like, okay, what did all the auto companies do in the last two years? Oh, they all lost sales. Their revenues are down. Their unit value, their unit dollars are down. Tesla's 50% a year, like clockwork. So you have a growth company, which when you have a growth company, that's how you determine the PE. Usually the growth rate per year figured annually out, you know, several years, that average growth is, is usually the PE. So if you're growing 40% a year, your PE is 40%, is 40 times. If you're growing 50% a year, 50 times, 50, 50 PE. So that's roughly, it's kind of a rough uh, rule of thumb. Then here's one that most of the people on the street don't pay any attention to, but I'm telling your audience, I'm telling you, you should pay attention to is something called ROIC, Return on Invested Capital. Again, there has never been a company in the history of the world that has the return on investment capital that Tesla does. What does that mean? That means for every dot, okay, so when I'm a manufacturer, Mm -hmm. I'm looking at that. I'm looking at that piece of automation equipment, and it's going to cost me a hundred thousand dollars to automate. And I'm going, how long will it take me to earn that back? How many jobs will it save? How much space in the factory? Whatever, all of the, or how much better will it make my product? Or how much less expensive will it make the unit cost? And I'm going, how long will it take me to get my money back on that hundred thousand that I'm going to invest? That's R O I C return mm -hmm. on investment capital. And it's usually thought of in terms of speed, how many years, how many months, you know, how, what, what percentage per year? Well, you look at uh, Tesla will say, oh, we're going to build a factory. And that factory is going to cost us a billion dollars. And then three weeks later, Volkswagen says, we're going to build a factory and it's going to cost us $4 billion. <laughs> and then That's Tesla difference. says, we're going to make, we're going to make a million cars in that factory. And Volkswagen goes, we're going to make 500,000 cars in that factory. And you're going, what? How can they stay in business if their return on invested capital is one eighth of what Tesla's is? How is that possible? And Tesla's just getting better and better at it. Their return on invested capital is getting better, not worse, to where they, again, I don't, th I think I can make the case. I have made the case. I'll be happy to make the case again that it's the best of any company in business today, and maybe the best that any company has ever had. Their return on investment capital sometimes is as low as one year. Mm -hmm. Get their, all of their money back on a factory in one year. Wow, that Under. was something new. Yeah, that is Under. something new, yeah. Uh, so I know you said margins matters. So what do you have to say with the Tesla price cuts? I mean. The price cuts, you know, which was the fifth adjustments in the start of this year, it has ranged from 4% uh, to 9% on Model S to Model X. And actually, as a result of which, it has boosted the demand, you know, of, of the EVs or Tesla EVs. Now, as we know, the quarter one report is due April 19th or the 26th. Uh, and on April 2nd, we have the delivery report, right? Quarter one. So, yes, if which as you said, it might out, it most likely will outpace quarter four. But by decreasing these price, won't the margins go down, even though they have higher margins? Now, that's my question to you. Now, does the market, the big institutions, the big investors, do they look at the numbers deliveries or they look at how much more in the back? Yeah, so so I think, I think that there is a chance that Tesla's gross margins on the cars is going to come in just over 20% instead of 25 or 27. Okay. There's a chance that that's going to happen. I think probably a good chance. They okay. said it won't, they said it won't drop. They made the statement it won't drop below 20. Now maybe they're wrong on that, but that's what they said. So let's say that it's going to be 20%. Well, that's going to hurt free cash flow and it's going to for that quarter and it's going to hurt total total uh, revenues or uh, uh, net net revenue, net profit for that quarter. Mm -hmm. But as I just mentioned a minute ago, You've got Lathrop over here uh, building um, uh, mega containers, mega packs uh, that are going out and they're building those at the rate of, um, uh, well, we're not sure yet, but some, it, the ramp will eventually be 10,000 of these 
container sized units a year at $2.2 million each. So you're talking about $22 billion a year just from that one little factory over in Lathrop. Well, $22 billion a year is roughly what you would expect um, Austin to do the first year. <laughs> it's roughly what you'd expect Berlin to do the first year. So Lathrop is going to be doing that. And most of the people that are trying to guess and make some estimates on this are coming up with somewhere in the, on the, on the range of 40% margins. So now so, you've got 40% margins on this huge new business. And they just said at investor day that they're going to continue to duplicate what they're doing in Lathrop as fast as they possibly can. Yeah. I mean, on the investor day, the main thing was, you know, clean energy, sustainable earth, and they wanted to reduce the cost of generation vehicle by 50% uh, with manufacturing efficiencies and a 40% reduction in manufacturing footprint. But once again, I keep going back to the same question, the stock price. Right. Yes. If the margins will not be as, as high after quarter one, most likely, the reason I'm keep repeating stock price is because I don't get the market. The market does not understand or has something against this guy because of his political intent, whatever it is. You know, we don't want to get into that nitty gritty. But the reason I keep asking is because won't that make the stock price bearish again? If you are saying... This stock price will be four hundred dollars. So once again, this is your guess. It's your yes. opinion. It's your yes. guess, not yes. a fact. I'm not a. I'm not. A, I'm not an investment advisor. Yes. This is not investment advice. Yes. <laughs> and and Gary Black today on his Twitter said the price target of Twitter of Tesla is three hundred seventy within six to twelve months. Once again, he's not an. I mean, it's the opinion. So my thing is, you know, the market does not see what we see, and maybe we don't see what the market sees. Okay, there's but these but you have to have everything, everything has to line up at the same time. So if we go into a recession mm -hmm. and it lasts for 12 months, my 400 number is off the table. It won't Do be you think we will go into the recession based on what's going on? Yeah, so I'll I, I famously stated this and I may live or die because it's on YouTube and it'll always be there. I don't see how we can go into a recession when there's 1.9 jobs chasing one person. <laughs> now, if you have one person chasing one job, okay, maybe you can go into recession. But typically in history, you've had one person chase, chasing 0.7 jobs or 0.6 jobs or no jobs. Uh, maybe I'm saying that in a way that is not understandable. There is 1.9, there's one, there's 1.9 jobs available today to be filled Employers looking for 1.9 people for every one person that's unemployed looking for work. This but is that's on the employment sector. What about the business but side? But, but my pro But what I'm saying is, this is historically un never happened. Never right. happened in any country in the world. Never right. happened in any state in the world. It is completely the flip of everything that you would expect. Okay. Right. So as long as you have that many employers looking for people and there's only that many people to fill those jobs, I don't see how you can have a recession. I just don't, I, I try to figure it out. I don't know how it happens. You would have to kill about what, what, over one of those jobs. You'd have to get it to where it's one-to-one -one or even less than one-to-one -one where, where there's people that are unemployed and can't find work, period before you can have a recession. And I don't see how that happens. I just can't figure it out. You know, it's funny. I want to talk more on this as the last topic. You know, I, I just have a couple more things on Tesla before we go into the recession, the Fed rate hikes. Because once again, it is all impacting Tesla yes. in, directly, indirectly, no matter what, right? Now, so, so my thing is now the investors, they, you know, as you know, Tesla had a bullish trend till then the stock price. And it completely tanked after that, you know. Uh, as of today, it's been fighting its resistance level of $197 per share. Yep. It's, it's still fighting. It's not breaking that threshold. So once it breaks that threshold, we can go into the 214 sector, which is the next resistance. So uh, my question to you is, like, you know, and also, I want to talk about the Gigafactory announcement in Mexico. And Ilan is also building a housing community for his employee, 
in uh, Austin, Texas for SpaceX as well as Tesla employees. Now, how do you think Tesla can have, actually, I'm gonna, sorry, I'm gonna go back. They want to do 20 million cars by 2030, right? In your Twitter, I actually saw you were very rational and logical. You actually confronted Gary Black or Ross Gerber, and you said, this is how I see it happening, right? And they see the other way around. But your approach was very logical and it made sense to someone like me who is an amateur in this sector, right? So my thing is, how do you think Tesla will be able to accomplish 20 million units? How do you think that's even possible, right? You know, I mean, I don't know. Maybe I'm not asking you the correct question. Like there is so much volatility around this stock price based on the external factors, the economy, but how do you stay so optimistic or, or what is your logic behind your optima, um, optimistic approach to Tesla? Being okay, so the, so the logic is very simple. If your audience doesn't listen to any quote that, if you're in business for yourself or if you wanna be in business for yourself, or if you work for somebody in a marketing capacity or a selling capacity, pay attention to this quote. If you're not making a compelling product at a compelling price, you shouldn't be in business. That's an Elon Musk quote. Mm -hmm. So Elon Musk understands that the only way that he continues to sell more and more and more and more product is he has to sell a compelling product at a compelling price. Now, if you could get I don't know. Do you drive a three or a Y? I actually, I don't. don't have Tesla I, yet? Okay. No, I don't have Tesla, but that's my next uh, car. You know, I, I, so my, I, so I my, have become a fan of uh, Tesla and Elon Musk, uh, like yourself, in the new, in the early stages. You know. So my my wife, I, I hope she doesn't mind me quoting her. She feels sorry for people that don't have a Model Y, <laughs> and she's not being she's not being mean. The Model Y experience, the Model 3 experience is just completely different than driving any other car. You no longer go to a gas station. You no longer go to a repair shop. Um, you no longer, you, you have you have capabilities in that car that are undreamed of in other cars. You have a car that keeps improving itself with over-the-air updates. You have a car that drives itself at some level, at a better level than any other car that's on the market today. We have full, full self-driving and it glitches and it does funny things, but it works a ton of the time. So you have a car, you have automobiles that are so compelling that it can they can charge above what the rest of the market charges and even add $15,000 on for full self-driving and people pay it. Now then, you have a better return on invested capital than any other company. Now that return on invested capital number goes into your margins. If you're getting your capital out faster, mm -hmm. then your marginal increase happens faster because you're no longer counting a capital expense against the cost of each individual car. So if you can re if you can get rid of all that capital expense in one year, then next year you're not taking any any capital expense out of that car. If it takes you 2 years, it takes you 2 years to get rid of that. So your margins already go up because of that. You already have margin advantage because you don't have a dealer network. You already have margin advantage because you're vertically integrated. You already have marginal advantage because you've been buying property and putting up factories at the speed of light that defies imagination. And you're building way more cars in a smaller footprint and you're buying, building them faster. Volkswagen says they build them three times faster than Volkswagen does now. That doesn't count what they're going to do in a year or two years. You have uh, um, Toyota saying that we finally looked at a Model Y. We actually took it apart like uh, like um, um, uh, 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 Sandy Monroe does. We took the car apart. It's a work of art, is what they said. Ford said they're a generation ahead of us. These are these are not com these are competitors right. telling people that these cars are so compelling that they can charge more than the market. But Elon doesn't want to do that. What Elon's going to do is he's going to he's happy to make 18% on operate operational margins, maybe 20% operating margins, which means he's got to make about 27 to 30% probably on the car. So what's he going to do? 
as he can, he's going to lower the price. He's not going to lower the price and get under 16, 70% operating margins. Right. He's only going to lower the price when he knows that he can maintain 16 to 17%. Now, does that mean every quarter? No, this might be a quarter because of the way the market is when you might have to make a little less, maybe even have to make a lot less to keep your mm -hmm. factories humming, to keep on doing the iterations that he's doing, to keep on making them better and better. Maybe you have to make a little less, but that means what? That means that you've made your cars better. And now next quarter, when the market comes back and people are buying cars again, then you can raise your price if you have to, or maybe you just don't have to lower it anymore this quarter. So now you're back to 27, 30% margins. Now, in terms of the numbers, in terms of getting to the quantities, that's all about going down market, all right? It really has nothing to do with well, it has to do with two things, execution on opening factories and, mm -hmm. and being able to build 20 million. So you have to build them to sell them. <laughs> but we've seen what he can do with factories. Um, he At this point, I'm speculating and others are speculating. He had originally said he needed 20 factories to get to 20 million. I think it's more like 10. 10 it yeah. may not even be 10. It might be nine or eight. So he's already got five, uh, five, yeah, five. Five. Mexico, counting Mexico, he got five. I think Indonesia is next. You can call me on that, but I think Indonesia will be the next one announced. Um, so that'll be six. So he's in 2023, he's already close to nine, uh, only three away from nine. So I don't think there's any issue with getting enough factories open in time. So now you got the factories open in time. Well, then making producing them, he's, he's that's already done. That's a proof positive that he can produce the cars. Now he's talking about producing a car at 50% the cost of the current Model 3. So if the Model 3 is costing him around uh, 26000 to build, and now he's going to build the car for 13000 or 14000 he can sell it for low 20s and make his 30% margins easily, and then sell software on top of that, and sell insurance on top of that, and sell charging uh, charging station uh, on top of that, and who knows what other sales, uh, SAAS might be put on top of that, and it just goes on and on and on. Um, it's it's hard to imagine how he doesn't get to 20 million. Everybody will want a Tesla. Now, here's the harder question, quite frankly, Sid. The harder question is, where do the other 50 million come from? Right. So my goal, my my guess is that the ICE age ends in 2027 that there will barely be any ice cars internal combustion engine cars made in 2028 there will be a few niche cars maseratis maybe or something there'll be a few companies that are still making a few niche cars just like there's probably a few flip phones still out there right <laughs> okay but but there'll be almost no ice cars made in 2028 but in order to do that you've got to have 50 million cars coming from other than Tesla in order to make the 70 million that the, that the, that the market demands. So that's the harder question is how does Ford and Toyota and, and uh, BYD Volkswagen, and, yeah. companies, Volkswagen and uh, yeah. So I did a whole string of videos. Nobody watched them. I guess nobody cared about the competition. <laughs> These are my worst videos ever. I did about, uh, I think there was 10 videos that, that looked into every single car company not everyone, but the top 13 or 14 car companies and said, where will they be in 2027? And so I have my picks of who I think is going to be the top car companies and it isn't going to be General Motors or Ford. <laughs> it's going to be- B BYD is one of the, I mean, it's the number one car company in, in China, China, Tesla is second and BYD is number one. But in BYD, of... is, BYD uh, Tesla is still number one in fully electric and in, in BEVs. Yes, they, in EVs. Uh, yes, B, that is correct. Uh, BYD makes a lot of hybrids. I think yes. hybrids will go. Though, that's going to be, that's going to be no market also. So, but uh, Hyundai, Kia, I think they will be uh, in the run. They'll be one of the biggest. They'll still be one of the biggest car companies in the world. And um, you know, we'll see who else steps up. It's uh, it's going to be interesting to see who else steps up because those three, to me, are the clear ones. Um, maybe Geely. Geely, I'm not sure whether you pronounce it Geely or Geely, but Geely seems to have enough interest 
They have a lot of Chinese uh, brands. Um, they seem to really care about the EV business. And so they could be another one that might be in the four, five million uh, unit. I mean, Li Auto, Lucy, these are one of the major players uh, Lucid, in, based Lucid. in China. Yeah. 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 You know, Neo, Rivian. But once again, from China, it's the LIE Auto, Li Auto, and Lucid, you know, along with BYD. As you said, that can kind of introduce that additional seventy million along with Volkswagen, Toyota. Yeah, so I don't know. I don't. I don't. I don't know where it's going to come from, but it's going to come from somebody, because the business is there and the technology is there. Yes, you will not. You will end up buying a BYD because you can't get a Tesla. Mm -hmm. Right. <laughs> you will end up buying a, a, you know, some of these other cars even though you prefer to have a Tesla, but you just don't want to buy another ICE car because it's ridiculous because you'll get everything you can get in a, an electric car on an ICE car. I mean, everything you can get on an ICE car, you'll be able to get in an electric car for a lower price and, and your operating cost of that car will be zero. And you'll already be paying less at the sticker and your operating cost will be zero. It's a no brainer. Nobody will want an ICE car. Simple as that. Yeah, I mean that would be great, though. You know, I I totally support that uh, that uh, thesis of yours or that uh, statement of yours. You know, I'm on board with that. So Couple here's of the things. question. But here's yes. the, here's, the, here's the issue with it. Back to the stock market, which I know is your one of your biggest issues. Right. So the story has to change. Nothing happens till the story changes. So you will watch Tesla continue to follow the market, in particular the GoGo stocks. It'll follow the market if the market continues to go back up again, which I think it probably will. If the market is now going to continue up again, then Tesla will continue up. And that's where we get to 400. OK, is if the if we get a bull, Tesla will go with it. It'll be it'll be along with the bulls. There will be a day, maybe it's second quarter earnings. Maybe it's third quarter earnings. Maybe it's not until fourth quarter earnings. There will be a day when the institutions will go. This is, in fact, a blue chip. It is a value, a place where we can put our money like an Apple, like a Costco, where we get, we're not worried at all that our money is going to go away, but we have this amazing upside potential. There's gonna, when that story becomes clear, that's when the stock will go to 700. And it, it may be because of a catalyst. Obviously, if Elon announces that you can now drive your Tesla from the back seat. That could make it. That could make it seven hundred in a few weeks. You know, uh, that kind of catalyst would be crazy. If Tesla announced that they are going to start doing robo taxis, but the entire fleet is now available to be robo taxis in the state of Arizona, the stock will go nuts. Okay, there's there's a few things like if Tesla announces that you can now buy. Um, uh, Optimus uh, for thirty thousand dollars a piece. Uh, all you have to do is make your two hundred dollar deposit. The stock market will go nuts. So there's a few big, big catalysts that could make it happen. But I'm counting more on the story change. When, because every stock has a story. When does Tesla's story change? Yeah, because there is a lot of you know uh, there is a source coin price. We stated that. Tesla stock price will reach $900 in 2034, which is completely, it's completely contradicts another source, which said Tesla stock will be $14,000, at least $13,000 by 2040. You know, it's just like, I don't know. I mean, it's just too much going on, but we will well, see. Yeah, but, but, but Sid, but Sid, again, the people like uh, like uh, uh, ARK Invest and, 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 and whatnot, um, that are making these predictions that it's going to be seven thousand dollars a share. Okay, these are based on full self drive no, robo taxi mm -hmm. and or Optimus. Those are the two biggies. Elon says no, the company is not an auto company, and it's not an energy storage company. It is now an AI company with a specialization in robotics. Those are the two biggies. Robot cars and humanoid robots, those are the drivers eventually mm -hmm. because it's massive. Energy storage is already making, energy storage and automobiles 
will already make Tesla the biggest company in history. Just those two. Right. If you add in the semi truck, which I believe they'll be selling a million a year by the end of the decade, that just adds another half a trillion dollars in sales. So now you have a company that's way bigger than the biggest company in history, maybe at 1.5, 2 trillion in sales, just with those three pillars, auto, energy, and semi truck. But if you throw on robots or you throw on robot cars, it's a $5 trillion company. Wow. Uh, last thing on Tesla before we get into the last story, which is the uh, last topic, uh, Fed rate hikes. Uh, you know, sorry, we've gone way over <laughs> the time limit, but, you know, this is so fascinating. I can talk on for hours and I'm sure so can you, you know. <laughs> so what are your thoughts on Tesla cyber truck, you know, which has 1.5 1 million reservations already uh, and they're expecting to kind of showcase that you know, definitely before the end of this year. And also the part on the 25,000 compact car, which is the Model 2, which Tesla, according to Elon Musk, will wait until 2024 to announce. And he said that Tesla's 25,000 small EV will operate mainly in autonomous mode, you know. And his main point was that you know, this will result in five times more value of the car, but the cost will stay the same. So operational cost the same, but the value five times more, which shows huge profit margins. Yeah. And that's what and that's Absolutely. what that's what banks, institutions love. And you know what? Once they see that, they will come running. Let's invest. Our money is not going anywhere. So what are your thoughts on on the cyber truck and now this you know 25000 compact car uh, you know give us your you know kind of analysis on this so um i'll start with the fact that i'm going to bring up my wife again my wife who is a university english professor um and uh, in her 60s um has a reservation for a cyber truck and going to trade the and going to trade her model y for a cyber truck oh wow <laughs> Okay, so just think about that. Let that sink in. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, so she's a pro Tesla. <laughs> well, she just she says, "Look, it looks safe." I didn't know this until I looked it up a couple of weeks ago. I was researching something else, and I looked this up. The number two reason people buy a car is for safety. I had no idea. As a Volvo driver, you know, I mean, I, Volvo is was known for being the for number safety. one car for safety. Right. Yes. But what what good did that do, Volvo? It's still a little tiny company compared to others. But the reality is, people really do care about safety, and in particular, I think women care about safety. I I know that sounds sexist. I'm sorry, but it's true. So uh, that's what she said. She said, "Look, it looks safe." It, I feel I think I would feel safe in that car. And duh, the thing is a tank. <laughs> so so um, no scratches, you know, you never it's no paint job. I mean, all these things that it's going to be able to do, it's just a crazy vehicle. Um, there, we won't know the story. We won't really know the story on the cyber truck until the first couple of reviews. Mm -hmm. from major automotive magazines. Um, you know, it'll be fine to have me or you or somebody else do a review on YouTube or whatever, you know, and people go, oh, well, that's interesting. That's interesting. No, it's going to take Road and Track or, you know, some of these other famous automotive magazines to come out and say, wow, we wrote this thing and it's a beast. I like to call it the beast. Um, it's a beast. It's crazy. Oh my gosh, what it can do. It can pull anything. It, the torque is amazing. Um, it can go side, you know, it has that the rear wheels are separate from the front wheels in terms of turning. Um, uh, you cannot break it. You can't hurt it. Um, it can go 500 miles on a tank. I mean, it, it needs to have a review from somebody like that. And when that happens, who knows what the numbers will be? Right. Um, it will be it will be like the Model Y. It will be a step change better than any truck on the market today. It, it won't be close. 
Um, so yeah, what does that usually do? Oh, and by the way, it's not that ex it doesn't have to be that expensive. In the beginning, we all speculate that Tesla will sell only in the most expensive models because they've got a 1.5 million unit backlog and they can only make probably 200,000 the first 12 months. So what are you going to sell? The most expensive one, of course. Right. But ultimately, they can get this car down. They said it was going to be $40,000. If they ever need to, they can probably get this car down to forty dollars to $50,000. And then it'll just be unlimited, I think. That's what I think. Yeah. And they're just starting. Who knows what they'll add to this thing over time. And what do you think about the $25,000 compact car? And especially... Uh, we saw, I think last week, Volkswagen announced this $30,000 compact car. But once again, they tried to take a shot at Tesla, but that thing will not come to fruition till 2025. So Tesla will still be a year ahead of them. So, I mean, it blows my mind away how the competitors, you know, they get scared and they want to scare the <laughs> biggest player in the game. And uh, it just backfires. So so what do you think about the $25,000 compact car idea? And uh uh, give us your take as on a that. as a manufacturer watching that part of investor day where where they talked about unboxed i was just like my eyeballs were just glued to the set i'm just like oh my gosh this is so smart and then uh the joe justice interview that i did the first one in the series of three where joe justice talks about how they do this agile plus he calls it agile plus uh, design and manufacture design and manufacturing on the factory floor where they don't just sit in a circle they sit in a circle on the floor on the chairs on the factory floor with their with their uh, 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 devices and they're actually inventing and creating and passing around to each other these inventions and these creations as they do it and then they're literally pulling in um uh, bits and pieces from the manufacturing floor. They might pull in a, a 3D printer or they might pull in a, an, uh, uh, a, a um, CNC machine and actually make the parts. They're sitting on the floor, they're, I guess, plugging it into the pole and they're making these parts to test them and try them. They're inventing all the time. The cars are always being improved. By the time we get to mid-2024 and the factory in... Um, in um, it, by the way, which may be sooner, way sooner than we think, that factory might be ready to go in March based on what they're trying to do. What Tom, the new uh, head of uh, production, said the other day, they might be, the factory might be walls on, rooftop done. Are you talking by, about the Mexico one? Mexico by March. Yeah, they said by a year. I saw that actually. Yeah, within yeah, a year, they're saying. Could be March. So if it's ready to go by March, who knows when the actual uh, generation three cars will start coming out of there. So if Elon says that they've already figured out how to do it at half the cost, I just believe him. That's why say that. You don't even need to say it. Okay, we've got 30% off. No, we know how to get it down to 50% off. So if you can get it down to 50% off, then they can sell it for 25,000. But what's the difference between that and a Volkswagen or a BYD or a, or a, or, or a, a, a Kia? The difference is it'll have all the Tesla stuff on it. It'll have, a, it'll have all the software. It'll have the full self-driving capability or as close as they've gotten by then if they haven't finally finished it. But it'll be better than anybody else's. Um, it will have all the technology benefits that Tesla has that makes it the safest car in the world by a lot, even before the um, auto, the uh, driver assist stuff. It's already the safest car in the world. Every single test, Australia, Europe, the United States, the uh, insurance industry testing, every test that's done on, on, uh, on uh, Tesla automobiles, they turn out to be the best in the world to the point where the insurance industry test last year, they had to change the test because Tesla was over 100% on the test. So in order to make the test work, they had to change the, the parameters, the key performance indicators, mm -hmm. in order to not have Tesla be over 100%. So they're already the safest cars in the world. So this car, this $25,000 car, which will be some kind of hatchback or smaller car, it's going to be safe. You can count on it. 
last topic of the day. Finally, we made it. Okay. <laughs> I know. Um, the collapse of the Signature Bank, uh, the SVB, and you know what's going on with the First Republic Bank, Credit Suisse. I mean, Credit Suisse is European bank, so we'll keep that out of the out of our loop. Let's focus on, uh, you know, the banking crisis. I mean, a bank collapses in in twenty four hours, and if you heard the press conference yesterday by Jerome Powell, he said that even they were surprised. Like, even they are trying to wrap their heads around it. So, 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 what's going on with the with the bank crisis, the interest rate hikes? Uh, do you support? Do you oppose? You know, would love to hear your opinion and your your uh, feedback on this. Well, first of all, let let it be said that I'm a huge Kathy Wood fan, and for anybody in your audience that wants to be a great investor, even if you don't believe everything she says, you should be listening to her every month on the first Friday on uh, the day that they give the unemployment numbers. Um, listen to her number. Her, she does a video that night um, after those are released. You should be listening to her every month. Um, it's a 45 minute thing. Or you can listen to my, the next morning, I do a version of what she said the night before that's shorter. So you can listen to my version. But Kathy Wood is brilliant. Uh, she's been at this game for over 40 years. She surprisingly doesn't look like she could have been doing it for 40 years, but yeah. she must she she has so anyway kathy uh said it months ago months and months and months ago she said the fed is raising rates way too fast never in the history of the fed have they raised interest rates this quickly they were raising raising it from such a low base of a zero basically a zero interest all the way up now to 4.75 to 5% there's nothing that you can compare it to so while I agree with Kathy and others who have said that SVB Bank was poorly run, mm -hmm. horribly run, all kinds of ridiculous people on the board that shouldn't have been on the board, all kinds of insane investments in terms of the people that they were investing in and the decision-making tree that they had for investing in some of these companies based on ESG instead of on the quality of their boards or on the quality of their products or on their margins or anything else. Huge mistakes by this bank, but I give them a break. I, get, I I'm willing to say, you know what? Given all of that, I still think they'd be in business if the if the Fed had not raised rates at this incredible at this incredible level, because their big problem was they were heavily invested in ten year bonds at one point seven percent interest, which at the time that they did that seemed really really smart, and a lot of other banks were doing the same thing. They could lock in 1.7% interest. Well, today, the bonds are at 3.4. 10-year treasuries are at 3.4. So the value of the underlying bond has dropped radically. SVB got into a situation where they needed to sell some of those bonds at a loss. They were on the books at a loss. The Fed could see that. The Treasury Department could see that. They were unrealized losses, big unrealized losses. I forget the numbers, but they were huge unrealized losses because of this. And yet the Fed didn't step in and the Treasury didn't step in. So bad on them. There was evidence. There were things that were being said weeks or months ahead of their collapse that should have been available to the Fed and to, and to the Treasury and certainly to the regional Fed, who's the most, who's the one that's paying the most attention to the local banks. So anyway, I think that uh, shame on everybody. Um, the lesson learned. Uh, I think that this crisis is over. That does does that mean no other banks will fail? Maybe another bank will fail, but it's probably unlikely at this point. The outflow of capital from the banking uh, from deposits has stopped, but there's still a lot of money that went out that might not come back in. So the banks are going to be dealing with less total deposits than they were. Uh, these A lot of these went into treasuries. A lot of these went into uh, market funds. Um, so they might just stay in those because they're getting a good return. Uh, or at least until that return doesn't is, is no longer that great. Uh, so um, the Fed, I think, has screwed up. They've gone too far. They should have uh, pivoted yesterday. They should have done a, uh, a zero but they at least gave us a little bit of hope in their dovish statement that they considered going zero. 
and that the, they didn't give a very hawkish statement with regard to future interest rates going up. So that part looks good. I think like Kathy and others, that the inversion on the 10-year versus the two-year has to be straightened out, and the Fed has the tools to do that. So it's come down. The inversion was as high as 100 basis points. That's historically nuts. It's never had an inversion never, of 100 yeah. basis points. And it's been inverted for almost a year now. That's never happened. We've never had this inversion for such a period of time. So that's telling the Fed that the market doesn't agree with what the Fed is doing. The Fed has the tools to be able to get that back to normal where it's not inverted. And I think the Fed should be working on that. And maybe they are because now it's down to just a right around 500 base, uh, 50 basis points uh, as opposed to 100. So it's, come, it's coming closer, but it needs to go the other way. Um, so I hope the Fed is done. They said that, I think the reason the market tanked yesterday was because they said that they were not going to lower rates this year. I think that they're foolish to have made that statement. I don't think that they know seven months out what they might have to do. So I think that was a foolish statement, but it was also a foolish thing to say. Right. I think that's what tanked the market. Although the market last time I looked was up today. So it seems- Yeah, but it, the moment two o'clock, I, I remember watching the market and the moment he said 25 basis point, the market skyrocketed and yeah, at yeah. three o'clock, within an hour, 500 points, tanked down. Right. Because as you said, they should have not said that statement because the market digested the 25 basis point, which 80% of them were expecting. But right. for them to say that we're not going to cut the interest rates or something. The rest of the year. Yeah, it just creates that fear and panic, you know? Right, right. So I thought that was a big mistake. I think, um, I think, I just hope uh, the the other thing um, um, is that Kathy again, Kathy Wood and others, um, and I agree with this, that the inflation is already down to 2%. And I don't think that the bond, the 10-year bonds would be at 3.47 um, if the int if uh, inflation was still at 4. Um, but the just, inflation is still at 6%. It just no, came in not. the last CBA report. Yeah, but that's you're looking at CPI and you're looking at PPI. PPI, by the way, was 0 or it was 1.1. So producers are already saying that inflation is over. So the CPI is saying that inflation is continuing, but it's mostly in housing and right. in services. And some of the services are things like uh, travel. Mm -hmm. um, I wouldn't be surprised to see travel continue to be a little higher. Although I just paid, I think it was only $375 for round trip to Hawaii from Los Angeles. So that's in half from what right. it was last year. So I don't know if uh, travel services, they may be coming down as well. So um, no, I, I mean, think the housing market has taken a big hit, you know, here in New York. It's, it's just been since October on was, it's just, down the hill, everything is like stalled, and uh, you know it is what it is. As you know, yeah, I think, I think, I think it's already over. I think the bond, so, so the bond market is the the stock market and the bond market are both, um, what you want to call it, uh, the the audience reaction or the you know it's the um, it's uh, uh, I'm trying to think of the word for this. What they call it, uh, where the where uh, a huge number of people are voting, okay? Massive numbers of people are voting what they think is going on. The Fed is 12, 14 people, I forget how many. Those 12 or 14 people and their employees, they're take, they have a vote, they have a really big vote, but the bond market has millions of people and the stock market has millions of people that are voting on what they think is happening in the economy. And right now the bond market is voting and they're saying, Inflation is over wow, because let's... nobody nobody puts money at three point four for ten years if they think inflation is four. Stupid! You're losing money every month. <laughs> yeah. Well, let's hope for the best, Randy. And 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 you know, before we wrap this up, uh, you know, if you want to share your uh, with the audience your YouTube channel name you know because you're active you know and i personally listen to your videos on a daily basis thank and, you, thank and, you, you. And, and you provide great information and insight and actually you know um uh, you know as i said if you want to give any last message to this to the audience watching this podcast 
share your share where they can reach. Please take it away from me. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I'm on Twitter. Uh, Randy W. Kirk one um, is my handle on Twitter on I have my YouTube channel, which is just Randy Kirk. You can just look me up, Randy Kirk. Um, I have um, what else do I do? Oh, I, well, you know, I'm a consult. I'm a marketing consultant. If you have a small business and you're, you know, thinking that you need somebody to come in and help out, um, I do marketing and business consulting. So you can, you again, you can find me on Twitter or YouTube. Um, and uh, yeah, that's where I'm mostly, I'm mostly Twitter and YouTube. Great. And, uh, you know, I mean, Randy, I just want to thank you so much. I mean, I know this went way over the time limit and, and, and we can still go on for some time because there were some topics that I also wanted to speak uh, regarding Tesla, but uh I mean, this, I have to say, this was really informational, engaging, you know, you have a great personality, exactly. you know, yes, yes, definitely. And uh, I want to thank you very much for your time, uh, for being a guest on our podcast, you know, we really Sid, appreciate it. Well, Sid, thank you for inviting me and bring me back when you need me. <laughs> yes, sir. Thank you so much. You have a great day. Thank you. Talk to thank you soon. Bye-bye.